here today who comes to us all the way from Delray, Florida, Colonel John Boyd. Thank you. Before we start, I want to ask a couple questions. Item one, how many people here have the, do you have a handout? No handout? Somebody, I know some of you people should have a handout. Okay, for the ones that don't have it, of course, we can't get it out now. You might want to get it later on. And the reason why I say this, because in the handout, for the people that have it, there are two basic items in there. One being the, the paper destruction and creation. That's an essay form. And the one right behind it, you'll see if you, about halfway through, you'll pick it up. A, a, a presentation called uh, Conceptual Spiral. Now, the destruction creation is written very tight. I think it's 16 pages. You can look, as I recall, I think it's... And uh, I'd wrote that back in 1976, and was, in a sense, what really got me going into the kind of things that I'm doing today. And the conceptual spiral was a takeoff on that. Together, what they really represent is basically what I call a foundation for vitality and growth, or in a more formal sense, what I call a foundation for comprehending, shaping, and adapting in an unfolding, evolving reality that is uncertain, ever-changing, unpredictable, in a very formal sense. The difference between them, they both talk about the comprehending, shaping, and adapting. And the second part is bringing out not only that uncertainty, not only that change in the unpredictability, but in a much deeper sense, in some, at least in some sense, in a much deeper sense, why it has to be that way. So today, I will not be briefing on the destruction and creation per se. The presentation I'll be given today will be on the conceptual spiral. And that's, that's the uh, presentation you see on the uh, screen up there. So that's what we'll be going through. Before that, though, in order to get a sort of a feel for how you people are, except for the ones that have heard, I see some familiar faces here, except for the ones that have heard the presentation before, I'm going to ask a few questions. Would you raise your hand? So the first question I'm going to ask is how many people here are familiar with Isaac Newton, or have heard about him, or read about him? Well, I see almost all hands go up, and that's not too surprising. How many people here have heard of okay, you know, Albert Einstein? Certainly have. That's another famous name. How many people here, I'm going to go into a different area now. How many people here have heard of Clausewitz? I'd be very surprised if you all hadn't heard or read about Clausewitz. And another one then, what about Sun Tzu? You should all probably heard of Sun Tzu. Now we'll switch gears, so I looked in that area. How many people here have heard of Werner Heisenberg? A few hands, but notice, there's way many, very small minority. Now I'm going to take it down to even a smaller minority. Remember, the ones I've heard the presentation before, I don't want to see your hand. How many people here have heard of Kurt Gödel? Kurt Gödel. Hardly anybody kind of back. It gets even smaller. Okay, now I'm going to shift into a new area. Now I'll explain why I'm doing this in just a minute. Obviously, I'm doing this for a reason. Next two people I want to ask, how many people here have heard of Taichi Ono? Talking about production and manufacturing. Taichi Ono. Okay, I'll flip flop it the other way. How many people here have heard of Henry Ford? Everybody. But nobody's heard of Taichi Ono. I don't see any hands. How many people here have heard of Shigeo Shingo? No hands. Well, they've done some phenomenal work. has a big impact today. You don't even know about it. Isn't that interesting? Well, Henry Ford was quite a ways back. The point that I'm making, these other people you haven't heard about have had a very major impact upon the way we do business in this sense. I'm not talking about business in a business sense only, but also in science, engineering, philosophy, and other areas, too. But we're going to talk about that today. That's what we're going to get into. I'm going to acquaint you with some people you haven't heard about and show you the impact. It's very important, and for, particularly for you people who are going to be in space cast. Because I don't think Clausewitz is going to help you too much here. But these other people can help. Maybe not in a one-on-one -on -one situation, but in an indirect way can help quite a bit. And that's what I want to bring out today. But before we do that, i got... One more preliminary, a few more preliminary remarks. First thing, there's, there's three ways by which you can insult me. Three ways. 
One is if you call me an analyst. If you call me an analyst, you're telling me I'm a halfwit. I got half a brain. The second way you can insult me is if you call me an expert. That means I got it all figured out and I can't learn anything new. You ever notice on TV, we always have these analysts and these experts? Got half wits and people got it all figured out. The talking heads they talk about. And the third way you could insult me is when you call me an analytical expert. Not only am I a half wit, I still think I got it all figured out. That's the worst insult of all. Now, to give you a feel why I say that, I'm going to take you through two thought experiments. First thought experiment. Some of you people have heard it before, and you know what I'm going through, so don't tip anybody off. I want you all to imagine you're out on a ski slope. Now, you all have different images. I don't care. I might have an image different than yours. I couldn't care less. Store that image. OK? Now imagine you're down in Florida. I happen to live there, but I, had this, I used this before I arrived there that you're out an outboard motorboat. You might even be towing water skiers. Just tow that image. You don't have to tow the water skier. We're going to have two more images and we'll operate on them. Third image. Let's imagine that it's a nice spring day. And you're out there riding on bicycles with other people. Store that image. Final image. Let's imagine that you're a parent. Some of you probably are. It's Christmas time. Take your son to a department store, young son. Of course, some old ones might be this way too. And you notice he's very fascinated by these toy tanks and tractors with these caterpillar rubber treads. Got it? Store that image. So about this point, you think Boyd's gone bananas. Maybe I have. But let's continue. Now let's operate on those images. Let's go to the first image. Let's highlight the skis and subdue everything else. We'll hang on to the skis and subdue everything else. Second image. Let's highlight the outboard motor and subdue everything else. Third image. Let's lift off the handlebars off the bicycles. We'll hang on to those and subdue everything else. Final image. We'll highlight the rubber treads, hang on to those and subdue everything else. Now let's tote it up. We got skis, we got outboard motor, we got handlebars, we got rubber treads. For those that haven't done it, glue those together. What do you have, anybody? Precisely. But it wasn't there. Now you got it. Isn't that amazing? You got a different domain. So let's examine what we did. Let's examine what we did there. So out of the first image, we took a feature. In this case, it happened to be the skis. In the, second, in the second image, we took out a feature. In this case, in every image, we took out only one feature. Doesn't mean you have to do that, but we did that. When you go from a hole down to a parts, what do we call that? Analysis. You go from a hole to its part, that's called analysis. Then what did we do? So we did analysis, in this particular case, four times. That's analyses, plural. Okay, then what did we do? In our mind's eye, we glued it all together and rendered the snowmobile. Some people call it ski mobile. Either one's all right. We rendered that. What, process, what kind of a process do you call that? Anybody? That's right. We did synthesis. But if we didn't do the synthesis, there's no snowmobile. Well, I'm asking you, what's your job in space cast? You've got to build snowmobiles. Metaphorically. You're going to have to look at different domains, pull this out, pull this out, pull this out, glue things together and do it in some kind of a compressed form so even the generals can understand it. Understand what I'm saying? Incidentally, that's, not, that's something we used to always say in the Pentagon. We've got to make this so even the generals can understand it. So it's not unusual. They, they knew it was being said, too. So that's the point. So the point is, you do analysis in synthesis. 
Now you see why I get angry when a person calls me an analyst, because I'm only a half wit. I'm only doing half the job. I only got half a brain. You look at all these books, universities, authors, lectures, etc. put out. Now it's talking about deducing and analyzing, deducing and analyzing, which is another form of the process. You hardly ever use the word synthesis. They feel embarrassed to have to use it. I've heard people say, well, that's a synthetic argument. What the hell's wrong with that if it's a good argument? You gotta weave them together. Now let me give you a more subtle example. That's a thought experiment, I'll give you a more subtle one. And some of the names will come up here. And the name that I asked you, you haven't heard of, is I'm gonna use first of all. More subtle argument. We use three domains this time. The first one I'm gonna talk about experiment is Kurt Gödel, mathematical logician, 1931, came up with what we call his two incompleteness theorem, of which I'll use the second one here. The second one, using arithmetic of whole numbers, he proved one cannot de demonstrate the consistency of such a system within itself. It's undecidable. In other words, you can't use a system's own workings to determine whether it's consistent or not, period. Even though it's consistent, you still can't do it. Can't do it that way. Doesn't mean you can't say it's consistent, but you're gonna have to reach outside. That's the whole point. Got it? Hang on to that one. Second one, name I use, some of which you heard, Werner Heisenberg. Associated with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the principle states very explicitly, one cannot simultaneously determine the position and moment of a particle. Of course, the particle he's talking about is a subatomic particle words like electron. Cannot do it simultaneously. Now, there was a lot of discussion of that when that came out. That was 1927, I might add, when that came out. And particularly Bohr and Heisenberg were very much caught up in it. And they explained it. Why that had to be that way is because the phenomena of observation, the stuff you're using to observe things with, is no different than a phenomena being observed. In other words, you're using electrons and photons to look at electrons and photons. Well, if that's the case, isn't that a system examining itself? Right. We're talking about electrons and photons, where Heisenberg was, I mean, Gödel was talking about whole numbers. Well, you can see then that that's also related to what Gödel was talking about. Now let's take the third one. The second one, well, if we take those two together before I make the next sentence. So therefore, if we generalize that statement, we can say, one cannot determine the character and nature of a system with help, not just mathematics, just consistency, and you're talking about other kind of phenomena in, uh, in uh, quantum physics. One cannot determine the character and nature of a system within itself. But now let's fold in the second law, second law of thermodynamics. In the most general sense of the state, all observed natural processes generate entropy. How many people have heard of the second law here? I'm sure a lot of you have. Okay. They might state it differently, but I'm using the general statement. All, natural pro all observed natural processes generate entropy. And well, how do they describe entropy? Oh, they describe it in many ways. Unavailable energy, incapacity to do work, confusion and disorder, equilibrium states, etc. Okay. Now let's examine that. So what does a physicist do to wax eloquently? He says, imagine a closed system. We have the second law operating. So we'll do that. Let's say we want to operate inside of a closed system. We want to observe what's going on inside that system. Figure out what the system's doing. Anything we do in that system, including observation, because it affects information theory, that means we're going to pump up the entropy. If that's the case, we're going to know less at the end of it than we knew in the beginning. Right. Closed system. Exactly right. That being the case, then, since they closed it by its own name, it'd be using, using the system's own ingredients to examine itself. You being part of the system. So that also fits with Gödel and Heisenberg, the second law. So in a very general way, folding all three together, you can say, one cannot determine the character and nature of a system within itself. Moreover, attempts to do so lead to confusion and disorder. Now, why would that be said? We'll blow that off. Well, it turns out I used that concept. How many people have heard of the OODA loop here? How many have heard? Okay. I've used that concept many years ago, back in the 70s. I thought about that combined with other things. I don't want to get into too much detail here because I've got a presentation I've got to go through here, but I want to give you some feelings how this works. And it occurred to me because of some tests we'd run and many other things, that if that's the case, if I have an adversary out there, what I want to do 
is I want to fold my adversary back inside himself so he can't really consult the external environment he has to deal with. If I can do that, then I can drive him into confusion disorder and bring about paralysis. And initially when I stated, I said, I'm going to do it in a temporal domain. In other words, as long in a temporal sense that I can put him, if I can operate at a rhythm or tempo faster than he can operate at, so he can't keep up with me, in effect then I fold him back inside himself. And if I do that, all game. We saw it in Desert Storm, you see it in basketball games, I got a whole other bunch of stuff here we see in many different areas. And it fits very directly. Girdle, Heisberg, second law, Tarski also in linguistics, and we find out E.T. Hall, anthrop cultural anthropology, and a whole bunch of different areas. We can't say it's not true. But then once again, if you only know military history, you're not going to see that. If you only know technology, you're not going to see that. If you only know mathematics, you're not going to see it. If you only know this, you're not going to see it. You got to know different things. We'll bring that up in discussion here. And I can't overemphasize that. Not at all. Okay, having built that up, let's hop into the presentation. The title, you'll understand why I picked the title I did. Next chart. Okay, note what I say there. To make evident how science, engineering, technology influence for bullying. Now, why would I even want to use that? Remember, science, mathematics, science, and that's the most precise way we can look at the world. Now, if we see some problem areas in there, that means we're going to have larger problem areas elsewhere, aren't we? So the question is, what can we learn from that? And what impact that might that have elsewhere? In the Air Force, we know it's had a big impact. Without airplanes, there's no Air Force. So Air Force tends to be very technology-oriented. In some cases, maybe too much in some areas to its own detriment. I'm not saying you don't want technology, but sometimes we can do it badly. Well, the reason why I'm looking at this, because if I can get some understanding there, maybe, and I've already given you some hints right now for those spot experiments I took you through, maybe we can get some insights in the way we can deal with the world, wherein we haven't been dealing with it as appropriately as we could have. Next chart. Next chart, please. So for openers, what I want to do is re-examine the abstract. Now, the abstract that I'm talking about here is the abstract that I have in my green book, which I call my green book, a discourse on winning and losing. What I'm going to show you in the next chart is a key passage out of that abstract, a key passage, and then kind of give you an idea why that passage is key. Next chart. I'll let you read that passage, then I'll talk to it. As a matter of fact, that's the final passage in my abs. Anybody with an idea in that passage? The idea is the game of analyses and synthesis. That's the key idea. And note what I say in that last sentence. As a result of the process, as a result, excuse me, the process not only creates a discourse, but it also represents a key to evolve the tactics, strategy, goals, unifying themes, etc. that permit us to actually shape and adapt to an unfolding world we're a part of, living and feed upon. We can deal with that world out there. That's a game you play. And I'm going to make it even more graphic as we go through the presentation. That's the game. And it's very important. I just took you through, through thought experiments. That's what we're talking about. Next chart, please. Next chart, please. So I say, why is this passage key? And I've already sort of suggested, because it suggests a general way which we can deal with the world around us. Or more specifically, by exploiting the theme contained in that passage, that's what we're talking about so far as a theme, and examine the practice of both science engineering and pursuit of technology, we can evolve a conceptual spiral, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll explain later why we call it a conceptual spiral, for comprehending, shaping, and adapting that world. First of all, we've got to comprehend the world, get information. And since we're shaping our view of that world, 
And then because we're acting upon that world, we also have to adapt to it too. In fact, in some cases, because we're changing the world itself, then it has a change characteristic, then we've got to change our characteristics the way we're going to deal with it. So it's one of those incestuous feedback processes in some sense. It's the way it works. Okay, next chart. Now, if we're going to use this, I want to sort of have a common ground. We want to be. So what I'm saying here in the last sentence, is speaking of science, engineering, and technology, what do we mean? I want to have a common departure point. We're going to expand upon that departure point in different ways. So next chart, let's get that common departure point. And so I have this, I call this my simple-minded message. That'll be evident as we go through, because as I get down toward the end, I'm going to modify the message. So what I say here, science can be viewed as a self-correcting process of observation, hypothesis, and test. That's not really a unique statement. Other people said it in a very similar way. So science really is a process, not just a result. It's a process. You make observations, you hop out hypotheses, you test those hypotheses, you might find out it didn't quite hold up, and you gotta go back through, reobserve, rehypothesize, retest till finally it seems to fit, and you say, I got a working one. At the point when you have a working hypothesis, well, now we'll declare it a theory. It seems to work. If some people have theories before they have hypotheses, which means that's baloney. They have, if it's untestable, they don't have much of a theory, at least from a scientific viewpoint. And likewise in engineering. Except when we're talking about a design, you're trying to render some kind of a design. That context. And then technology, which flows out of that, can be viewed as the wherewithal or state of the art produced by that, all that activity. We talk about new ideas, new materials, new systems, etc., or even new process. And then with those new things, it allows us to look at the world in a different way, then therefore we generate even better observations, or new kinds of observations, new hypotheses, new tests, new designs, etc. So it's a one huge cascading feedback loop. Feeding on it. Exactly what it is. Okay? Next chart. Now, what I'm interested in, if this stuff is so fantastic and it's done so much for us, couldn't be good or bad. And I'm kind of interested in the results. What did they pump out? What is that output? I like to, I'm always output oriented. And let's examine that output. And what does that output tell us? So that's it. What is it? What has given us and done for us? That's what I'm going to. What has it given us and done for us? I'm going to look at the output. So let's, on the next four charts, we're going to look at some of that. Next chart, please. So we'll look at science first. I have two charts on that. And note where I start Isaac Newton. Remember I asked you that? Everybody familiar with Isaac Newton? One of the contributors. And note what I say Acton's predictability by his laws of gravity. Uh, Laws of uh, motion and gravitation. What happened? What did he basically do? Prior to Newton, they thought there were certain kind of laws that applied to people on Earth. There were different kind of laws that provided in the heavens or out there in the cosmos. And so what he did, he showed the same laws applying to cosmos as well as on Earth. So that's what it was called, as a matter of fact, the grand, note the word. You can call the grand an analysis, the grand synthesis. It was grand sentence. Okay? Then you got Adam Smith. I'm here with him. Foundation for what I call modern capitalism. Then you got Ampere and Gauss. Note that. Exact is predictably by electric magnetic laws. Had electric laws, had magnetic laws. Hadn't joined them at that point. They were separate. Then we got Carnot, Kelvin, Clausius, Boltzmann. We already talked about decay and disintegration by the second law of thermodynamics. Fill up in the dates indicated. Then we got Faraday, Maxwell, and Hertz. Oh, very interesting. Union of electricity and magnetism by a field theory. Today we call it electromagnetic theory. In other words, the second grand synthesis, which Faraday came up with the idea of fields. Maxwell put it together in his four equations, and then Hertz came up with a critical experiment to demonstrate, hey, guys, it's true. It works. And today that's very fundamental. Many things we do today. Many areas. Very fundamental kind of stuff. Okay, then you got Darwin and Wallace, evolution by a theory of natural selection. Then you got Marx and Engels, and some people object to that. They say, what the hell, boy, what did you put that in there for? It didn't work. Basis for modern scientific, just because it didn't work doesn't mean they didn't try it. They had some observations, they had hypothesis, we ran the tests over 70 years, it bombed out. Didn't make it. 
their term, not mine. They call it scientific socialism, but it didn't work out. Sort of a painful experience. But we went through it. And we got Gregory Mendel. I heard about that. And you got Henri Poincaré. Inexactness. He did other things too, but I'm pointing this one in particular. Inexactness, unpredictability by a gravitational influence of three bodies. Remember what Newton did was always looking at two bodies. Three bodies. And what he found out, what they were trying to do from Newton on, they wanted to get what they call a closed form and exact solution. Poincaré proved you can't do it. You need a three or more body. No way, Jose. Cannot be done. And I get those closed form solutions. It opens solutions. Now they have ways of dealing with it, but not exactly. There's unpredictabilities associated with it. Okay, sort of keep that chart in mind. Next chart. Now we're up to the 20th century. Move it over a little, please. Thank you. So you got Max Planck, date indicated. Now we're beginning discreteness, discontinuities. Why is quantum theory? In other words, things just didn't, one thing just flow nicely into something else. You get hops, skips, jumps, that kind of stuff begin to show up. Albert Einstein, oh, that put it all nice back together again by a special and general relativity theory. But then we have these next guys that came along, Bohr, Broglie, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Dirac, and still going on to the present day. That's why I call it at all. And certainty indeterminism in quantum physics. Certainty indeterminism. You can't pin things down. Good night. And you got Leuvenheim and Skoll, dates indicated. Unconfined are what I call non categorical in mathematics and logic. Let me explain that. But basically, they came up with the idea that you just cannot say, make mathematical statements and say it's unique only to that system. You can say it's unique to that system, but not only. Those things can leak out and go in different areas, just like we built snowmobiles. It took things off here, things off here, and leaks out. Same thing happens in mathematics and logic. Now, they use the term non categorical I tend not to like that term, so I use the word unconfined, and I like that better. Wouldn't you? You really can't confine things. You can't say that. Okay? Girdle, Tarski, Church, and Turing. Well, I talked about Girdle. Incompleteness, undecidability in, math in mathematics and logic. Now, Girdle did it in mathematical logic. Tarski also did it there. He also showed in natural languages you have the same problem. Many of you people have, that have had uh, computer science and have obviously heard of the Turing machine and all that, the work that Turing did. How many people here have heard of Turing? I'm sure many of you have. Yeah. So we see it there. Then you got Shannon, 1940. Information theory is a basis for, for communication. And interestingly enough, when Shannon came up with information theory, he derived an interesting equation, came up with one. He looked at that equation. He says, isn't that interesting? Then he looked at the, he noticed that it had the same, it was the same equation that Boltzmann and guys came up with in the second law of thermodynamics. So in a sense, he was tying information theory to the second law. As a matter of fact, in information theory, they use the idea of what? Entropy. Exactly. Exactly. Sometimes they call it eigentropy, too, but they use the term entropy. Okay? Then you got Lorentz, Prigogine, Mandelbrot, Feigenbaum, a whole bunch of other guys since the 60s and 70s and still going on. What we call nonlinear dynamics. And today, anybody, what's the buzzword they use today to describe that? Chaos theory. It's a mistake. It's not that you don't have chaos. You have chaos may be in nonlinear dynamics, it may not. Sometimes it goes chaotic, sometimes not. And so the reason why they chose chaos because they're trying to suck out money from the government and other people. That was a buzzword, and they know you want to get the right words so you can get more money from people. In fact, the guy admitted that. He said, after all, we've got to survive too. He didn't say it exactly that way, but that was clear what he was talking about. PR. They use PR too. Okay. And then you got Bate, Chaitin, and Bennett. Incompleteness, incomprehensibility, and information theory. As a matter of fact, via what Chaitin calls algorithmic information theory, he was demonstrating the same things that Gödel demonstrated in mathematical logic. So it's also an information theory. Now, if I reach back up and look at Tarski up there, he was demonstrating those same kind of things in natural languages. So it goes in many different areas. So it can't be ignored. So the question I have to ask you now, What's the difference between this chart and the preceding chart? Anybody? Take the whole chart. Say again. 
Yeah, okay, I'll broaden it. So right. In the previous chart, what are they trying to do? They're trying to put everything in a nice, neat package. In the second chart, they blew the package apart. Not that neat. First chart, you have neatness. Here, it's got very unneat. Or as he was saying, determined versus, in other words, determine is very neat cause and effect relationship. Here you get cause and effect relationships, but they're very unneat. It's not what you call strict determinism. There are, might be some of it there. But there's a lot of stochastic processes in there. You can't even tie back to determinant. So one's neatness, one's sort of unneat. So the more we look at the world, the more we find that out. I said, you people then were familiar with Newton and Einstein are putting neatness. You weren't, you weren't familiar with the unneatness. Uncomfortable. But that's the world we've got to deal with. It's the world you've got to deal with. I want to make you uncomfortable. Because then you're going to have to do something. Okay, next chart. Now look at science. I'll go through this, I mean, engineering. Note the first one, Savory, New, Coleman, and Watt. Steam engine, dates indicated. Stevenson, steam railway. Pixie and Jacoby, AC generator, AC motor. Note the dates, very early in the 18th, 19th century, excuse me. Then you got Samuel Morse, you're all familiar with that, learned that in high school or grade school. Telegraph. Through Calvert there, photography. Then you look at uh, uh, Plank, first rechargeable battery dated. Graham and Fontaine, DC motor, DC. Auto, four cycle gasoline engine, very important. What do we have in automobiles today? Four cycle gasoline engine. Very important idea. And then you got Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone. Then you got Thomas Edison, the phonograph. Puts, record, put sound and record it. Then you got Edison again, electric light bulb. Siemens, electric locomotives. Germany, electric melt. In other words, they take a locomotive, like electric metropolitan railway within a city. Parsons, steam engine. Benz Dammer, gasoline automobile. What we have today. Now we got automobiles. Take the engine, put it in there. Horseless carriage, gasoline automobile. Okay, then you got Edison, Leroy, Armand, etc. I want to talk this one. Motion picture, camera, and projector. Could they have done that without photography? No. Could they have done it without optics? No. Could have done it without mechanics? No. Et cetera, electricity, et cetera. In other words, they took different features. They made their snowmobile, took something here, something here, something here, something here, glued it together. Result, motion picture, camera, and projector. That was their snowmobile. Using my metaphor. Tesla and Marconi threw the wires away. Wireless telegraph. Rudolf Diesel, Diesel Logan. We got now we got steam, we got electric, we got diesel, named after him. Elect Italy, electric railway, 1902, between cities. Next chart. We've got one more of these and we get off these charts. But I have to get gasoline powered airplane. No tech, Christian Homer, 1904. First idea on radar, 1904. Get a pattern. Of course, we didn't get it till just before World War II. Then you got Paulson and Fessenden, wireless telephone. Now they threw the wires away and you talk to people without wires. And then you got, just before World War I, then you got Fleming and Lady Forrest, vacuum tube. Why was that, what's what I call the first revolution in electronics? Why was that important, that vacuum tube? Anybody? Why was the vacuum tube important? Say it, somebody said it. Exactly. You amplify your signals. Before that, they couldn't reach out very far. They had vacuum tube. Fleming, the, the diode, and the DeForest, the triode, and of course, since then, they were up to pentodes and all that stuff. But they amplify signals so you could reach out great distances. Before that, they had spark gaps and all Other synthesis. And then you got USA Pittsburgh. That's KDK, first public radio broadcasting. No later today, I think, KDK. Then you got American car local. Now you're combining diesel with electric. Then you got Bayer, Scotsman, television, 1926. Very grainy picture, but he had one there. Then you got Warner Brothers, first jazz sound motion, I mean, the first sound motion picture was a commercial called The Jazz Singer. Germany, USA, 32, 34, Diesel Electric Railway. Britain, USA, Germany, Operation Radar, all of them had it just before World War II. Of course, some were better than the others, but nevertheless it was there, and we still got it to this day. It's been amplified and going all kinds of different directions now. Then you got Hans von Ohain, Germany, jet engine, jet airplane. Does anybody know when that came out? Anybody know here? 
Somebody said it. Who? Well, late 30s. Came out before World War II. They had that thing flying before World War II. Right. And of course, you all heard of the ME-262, which actually grew out of that process toward the end of the war. But they delayed it, and they hurt themselves. OK. Then you got Eckert Mousley, first electronic computer. Anybody know what the name of that was? Somebody said it. Yeah, ENIAC. Basement of the universe, some big building, basement of the University of Pennsylvania. Huge monstrous affair. Vacuum tube wires always breaking down. But they had it. Now we got we can do better than that on a little PC. Okay, then you got Bardeen, Brat, uh, Brayton, and Shockley, the transistors, second revolution. Throw away the vacuum tubes. Now we got transistors. Now we can squeeze things down. Then you got Ampex, first video recorder, and Kilby and Noise, first integrated electric circuit. Now, that's the basis for all our microchips today, including transistors and circuits. Just squeeze it down even further. Basis for all our microchips. Very important. That's the third revolution. And Maiman, you can see him laser, Phillips, video cassette recorder, Sony finally video camcorder, and I cut it off in 1980. Of course, there's other things too, you can throw other things in there. We see that. Okay, so now we've looked at science, we've looked at engineering. What's the message? Next chart. So we ask ourselves, look at the past, why are the contributions of these people that provide for the world? What can we say about our efforts for now and the future? And we say, we got a lot of evidence out there. So let's just squeegee all that down that we've looked at, and let's lay out what I call a grand message. Next chart. I'll let you read it. In fact, after you read this chart, we'll take our first 10-minute break. I'll Talk to it, and we'll take a take break. Only 10 minutes. I'm cheating on you, not 15, because I didn't get you for two hours, and we started late. I got to take a piece out of your hide. <coughs> Otherwise, we won't get through. That's why. Know what I'm saying there in the beginning? Look at that first thing. I lay out all those things named. I say, not only do the statements representing a theoretical set for explaining some aspect, explain it inadequately or imperfect, like it or not, you spill out beyond any one system and do so in unpredictable ways, and then I turn it around the other way. We can neither predict the future migration evolution these statements, nor just confine them to any one system, nor suggest they fully embrace any such system. You know that. And marching up into the scientific engineering sense, the four statements I have there. Squeegee it down even tighter. So my last statement, which all together imply that, and I put it down in one state, bottom there. Take all that above and you squeeze it down. That's what we got to face up to, which imply the bottom statement, the implication that flows out of that, which also flowed out of the previous stuff we looked at. Well, if that's true, then what those people want to do in the 19th century can't be done. Can't get all that pretty. You're not going to nail things down, like it or not. You may nail some things down, but other things you're not going to nail. And what I'm telling you, that's the way it is. Now, does anybody have any questions before we take our break? I'll give you a 10 minute break. Go ahead. What chart, what chart are you talking about? Oh, you're talking about where I had the contributors? OK. Oh, between the two charts. That's correct. That's, that, that's correct. I didn't do that, and that's correct. You'll notice that particularly when you go down the chart. That's absolutely correct. And we see more of that today. You have to do it by teams. It's getting more complicated. We see that more often. That's a good observation. Anybody else? Let's take a 10-minute break and come back, because we've got some other things I want to go through with this, because this is, we're, just up at a, we're coming up with some key information here. So take, please take 10 and no more. Thank you.
Okay, so now what we've done, we've shown these contributions, we've shown a grand message, so obvious question. If you look at these things together, what do these things really suggest? Raise an interesting question. Next chart. And what am I really getting at? Here's the point I'm getting at. Here's an impression we're left with, and that's what I call it, an impression. While we can comprehend and predict some portions of the ever-changing world that unfolds before us, others seem forever indistinct and unpredictable. In other words, we get two kinds of things. Some cases we can predict things, other things we can't. We get two parts of the world. In order to build on that, let's go to the question. Next chart. So it raises a rather interesting question. Very nice, but what does all this have to do with our ability to thrive and grow in such a world that is seemingly ordered and predictable, yet disorderly and unpredictable? In other words, we seem that we've got a kind of a mixed bag here. That's exactly right. But how is it mixed? Well, we're not really sure. But let's take some ideas from this new world, what we call, well, it's not a new world, it's been there, but the new way they've been expressing it, nonlinear dynamics. And we have people saying and knowing from their own experience, the linear phenomena swim in a nonlinear sea. In other words, the nonlinear stuff totally overwhelms the linear phenomena. In fact, some people say, if you want to look at an iceberg, the linear phenomena is only the tip of the iceberg. And some other people say it's really the tip of the tip. And as somebody's remarked, yeah, but that's the stuff we like to study. It's easy. That's why. Nonlinear, messy, dirty, hard to come to grips with. But that's the world we have, primarily. It's the overwhelming part of the world we've got to deal with. And the more you lift yourself away from math, physics, chemistry, into biology, anthropology, sociology, the more nonlinear, more unpredictable, the more messy it becomes. You still got to deal with it. And that's, you people are going to have to deal with it in your efforts in space gas and other activity. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Next chart then. But here's the comment I want to get at. Get at that question we had in the previous chart. Let's take a closer, more general look at what science, engineering, and pursuit of technology produce and accomplish. No, two points here. What the heck are we producing here? And how are we going about that? And the second bullet. Furthermore, suspecting that these practices pursued are not wholly accidental or obvious, and they seem to change us, it's also examine what keeps the whole enterprise going and how this enterprise affects us. In other words, what's the mechanism that seems to make this whole thing unfold the way it does? And how is it changing us as individuals, or as groups, or as societies, or whatever? So to make it very graphic, let's go to the next chart. So we're going to address really basically four questions then, which were in a previous chart. What do science, engineering, technology produce? How is it accomplished? What's the driving mechanism? How does it affect us? We'll go through in that order. Act in that order. Well, let's take the first question there. What do science, engineering, technology produce? Next chart. And look at that. Note what I'm saying here. We examine all that stuff we've been talking about here. What do we see? We see new ideas, new systems, new process, new materials, new etc. 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 New, 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 new. In other words, in other words, science, engineering, technology produce change via novelty. We're producing novelty using that. Different kinds of novelty. Newton couldn't have known what Faraday, Maxwell, and Hertz and what we're doing today. He couldn't have known that. And things we're doing today, we can't know what some people are going to do many years hence. Some things we won't, many other things we won't. That's the way it is. Well, that's what I'm saying. What does it produce? Change by a novelty. Next chart. Now, this one you're sort of familiar with. I gave you some thought experiments. How is the novelty produced? I want you to read that. And I'll talk to it.
In other words, to deal with that world, we're pulling things apart and we're putting them back together. We're going through the analyses and synthesis. And since we're part of that world, we're actually interacting with the world. So not only are we trying to comprehend, shape, adapt that world, but we're also changing the world in a sense too. And as already inferred, we're probably changing in ways we really don't understand. Or it's also changing us in ways we really don't understand. Maybe some ways, but many other ways we don't. We find out much later. Exactly. Next chart. And so this is my point on that. Novelty is produced by a mental physical feedback process of analogy that senses permits us to interact with the world so we can comprehend, cope with, shape that world as well as be shaped by it. We're not only shaping it, it's also shaping us. Now in terms of some of the new ideas since Darwin, where he talked about natural selection, now they're talking about self-organization and natural selection. Some of the new biologists, and other people, talking about that. And not only is it just talking about evolution, where the environment shapes you, they're talking about co-evolution. You shape the environment, the environment shapes you, and you're going through this feedback process, and you don't know where that's going to end up. Or co-evolution. How many people have heard that word? Nobody. Another new idea. Or somebody, I guess you raised your hand in the back there, didn't you? Co-evolutionary processes. And you join us your people here in a cultural sense. If I interact with you, you get ideas from me and you change your behavior, and I get ideas from you, we have a co-evolutionary process here, at least in a cultural sense or an interactive sense. We also, in the terms of the natural environment, we see the same thing too. A lot of new things coming about here, and I'm trying to get, I'm, what I'm really trying to get you away, not trying to drive you away from Newton, but I'm trying to bring out, there's many things that have happened since Newton and Einstein and that. We gotta come to grips with those, and it turns out these new things are also very applicable to the areas that we can deal with in a social sense, or in a cultural sense. In other words, in a more complex sense. Okay, next chart. So then we go to the next question. What is the driving mechanism? This may surprise you, which is in the second bullet. Note what I'm saying there. If our ideas and thoughts match perfectly with what goes on in the world, and if the systems or process that we design perform perfectly, what would be the basis for everything work? There wouldn't be no basis. You gotta know. In other words, the presence and production mismatches are what sustain and nourish the enterprise of science, engineering, and technology and keep it alive and ongoing. Otherwise, there's no base for it to continue. The mismatches are stimulated. You had it all figured out. Nothing new to learn. Everything matched up. It's mismatches driving mechanism. Now we get new matchups, but those new matchups also generate what? New mismatch. Exactly. Exactly. Next chart. Now, so I say, how does this enterprise science, engineering, and technology affect us personally as individuals or groups or society? I'll let you read it. I'm going to comment on it. So what am I saying there? By going through this process, we're constantly doing what? Changing our orientation. We're always reorienting. We're reorienting all the time. So orientation is just not a state you're in. It's a process. You're always orienting. Otherwise, the world's static and there's no change out there, and you've got to keep working that. How many people here have heard of the OODA loop, haven't you? Let me just digress here. It's related to this, and it's very important, this idea of orientation. I want to connect it to the OODA loop right now, which is another presentation, but it turns out it's important. And it goes like this. Remember we talked about earlier where we want to get inside a guy's tempo or rhythm. We could pull him down. 
And we know that human beings have to do it. We have to observe what's going on out there. We've got to get an image or picture in our head, which we call orientation. Then we have to make a decision what we're going to do and then implement the decision. So we call it OODA, observe, orient, decide, act. And we look at the actions and our observations, plus drag in new data, get a new orientation, new decision, new action, ad infinitum. Okay. But the most important part of that OODA loop is the orientation. It's the driver. It's the share pump. It's the key. The reason why your orientation is made up of three things. One, your genetic heritage affects that. Your cultural tradition, your previous experience. And that's you. That's you. Those things are repository of you. But what happens is you just don't see the world any other way. Those things such as your genes, your cultural experiences, color the way you look at the world. They color the way you look at the world. If you and I would read the same book, since we have different orientations, I would tend to highlight things differently than you did. So I can get a different image than you get. That's not bad. To use an example, if many of you people play this parlor game in which you put 20 guys in a circle or girls and guys, whatever you want to call it, and you give a message to the person on the left. Not too simple, but reasonable message. You say, you know, I want you to pass the exact message on and have each one do it all the way back until it comes back to the guy that passed it on. When it gets back to him, it's not what he said. Why? Anybody, why did that happen? And the people aren't being malicious. They're really trying to get it right. Why would that happen? We already talked about it. Come on, cough it up, somebody. Exactly, say it out loud. That's right, each guy's got different orientation. So what are they doing? Each person is highlighting and subduing or emphasizing, de-emphasizing different things. And after you walk that through about 20 minds, it's different. Exactly. Right. We all don't have the same orientation. Similar, but not the same. If you work together, it gets more and more similar, but always not the same. Okay, next chart. So the orientation, the second O in the loop is the most important O because it drives the whole loop. Colors your observation, colors your decisions, colors your action. In fact, you can sort of consider guidance and control part of the OODA loop. Guides and controls the other activity. Okay, with that in mind, know what I'm saying here. Now I like to always go back. I always like to, I'm one of these guys that likes to look back into something. I said, if we reverse direction re-exam where we've been, what, what what can we see? Or we can see with that. Without the intuitive interplay of analysis, we have no basic process for generating novelty. If we throw that out, how are you going to generate the novelty? No way, Jose. Second part, we have no basic process for addressing mismatches between our mental images and impressions and the reality it is supposed to represent. And thirdly, and no basic process of reshaping our orientation toward the reality that undergoes change. We know that's happening. So, or put simply, without the interplay of analysis and synthesis, we have no basis for the practice of science engineering and the pursuit of technology. Since novelty, mismatches, and reorientation as the lifeblood ingredients that are naturally arise out of such practice and pursuit can no longer do so. Period. Can't happen. Next chart. Now I want to go back again. Now remember, I had that simple-minded message in the beginning in which I said we can view science as indicated above in engineering. In other words, it's those self-correcting processes. Science being self-correcting in terms of observation, hypothesis, and test and engineering, observation, design. But I said, in view of what we've done here, and we've looked at things, we probably should modify that. Why? Because if you look at a hypothesis, that didn't arrive out of a vacuum. That just didn't happen. Things had to take place there. And we know what had to take place. You don't only had to have observation, but you had to do the analyses and synthesis. And not just an observation, many observations. Otherwise, your system locked up inside yourself. So then we should say it can be viewed as a self-correcting process of observations, analyses, synthesis, hypothesis, and test. And likewise, engineering. Except we put in design rather than hypotheses. Or an artist. He makes observation analysis and more intuitive analysis synthesis, and he would call it a rendering and a test. Test it against the public. They buy it or don't. Now we see something else here, too. If you look at that, 
Observations is certainly related to OODA loop observation. Analyses and synthesis, when you're getting your orientation, you're doing analysis and synthesis, aren't you? Analysis and synthesis. And the decision is nothing more than the rendering or the design or the, or the, or the hypothesis. So the OODA loop and it are directly related. One's maybe a little bit more informal than the other, but it's still done. Same thing. And the test is the action or the implementation, whatever you want to call it. Same stuff. No different. So we can see that. Very important. I can't de-emphasize that. So what happens if you go through that? Let's take the science, for example. Observation, analysis, sense, hypothesis, test. You can keep going around and find you say, hey, that thing's kind of holding together. Then we you can't call it a theory before you run the test. Because the theory assumes that what you're saying about the world there, and indeed, is kind of correct. If it isn't, and it's flawed, no hypothesis. And someday, the guy said, I got a theory, totally untestable, not even related to the world. No theory. I don't know what it is. Might not even be a hypothesis. And again, it might. Some kind of a rendering, but I don't know. In any case, why do I make that statement, make those modifications? Without the interplay of analyses and synthesis, one can evolve neither the hypothesis or design and follow on test, nor the simple minded message nor even this presentation itself. I couldn't even come up with this presentation if I did it. No way. So you people are going to be involved with SpaceCast. You're going to have to look at all different kinds of things. Not as individual, but as individuals working together. And then you're going to have to cough up something, not just another, like I said this morning, more analyses by itself. You're going to have to cough up some kind of a sense. Out of it. You're going to have to cough that up. The Pentagon, when I arrived there, I guess I talked about that this morning. The Pentagon, when I arrived there, and they put me in charge of plans. Of course, just because you have plans over the door doesn't mean you do plans. That's a facade. You know what their plans were? Roadmaps. I said, we want some new roadmaps. I started looking into it. My God, I couldn't believe what I found. There's roadmaps all over that damn building. So I penetrated even deeper. I said, where do these things come from? And then I found out. Each little bureaucracy there, little cell, every year they go through this drill. they got to have in the, the R&D community come up with a new roadmap for what they're going to do. And they all know that they're going to do it annually. So they have the previous roadmap, so they just keep adding new and new things onto it. And you've got this huge gargantuan mess all these bits and pieces unrelated. And they want me to contribute to that mess. Because I'm going to hose the general on this one, so I'm going to go up there and he's going to get angry, but he's going to listen. So the first thing I went in, I said, first thing we've got to do is have no more roadmaps. My God, they went into shock. They thought I was against all R&D. I said, let me explain why. I said, let's examine. Are we getting smarter and able to do business better as a result of these additional roadmaps? Or are things getting more confused? They admitted that. I said, well, that means we don't want any more roadmaps. We've got to put this stuff together. That's the analytical side. See what I'm getting at here? That'll put things together. That's why when I kept putting out roadmaps, they weren't doing planning. Planning assumes there must be some kind of a synthesis there. That's why I say just because they have plans over the door doesn't mean they do plan. Likewise, a strategy. A lot of guys have strategy over the door. That's also another synthesis. That doesn't mean they, they, they don't have strategy. It's only strategy the name. OK, next chart. So you're probably wondering, what the hell is this always bearing on winning and losing? You know, because after all, we've gone through this drill. We kind of like to relate it to the business we're about. Hey, let's go to the next chart then. I'll let you read it. Illumination. Know what I'm saying? It's not only produced by the practice of science engineering in a pursuit. It's produced by the force of nature, but I'm thinking as well as by others. I mean, that's us coming out of the woodwork everywhere. Note the next statement. Then it's not smooth, it's erratic or haphazardly. You don't know how that's going to all happen. So 
when I get down to the bottom, when I'm in San Francisco, you go through that whole thing, over and over, this continuing world, reorientation, mismatch, analysis centers, reorientation, et cetera, et cetera. And what does it do? It permits us to comprehend, cope with, shape, and be shaped by that novel that's always flowing over us, or through us, around us. It's happening. nice tight little world where there's no change they're dinosaurs they're gonna die the name of the game is not to become a dinosaur Jeez, I don't want to go up there and get at a high peak and then walk around like a vegetable the last 10 years of my life I want to keep myself going until the last minute when the all the lights go bang over And if it looks like I'm going under, I'm going to probably call Kevorkian and say, God damn you, I got a job for you. <laughs> Me. A lot of people are listening to this guy. It's not, you know, when they're in pain and things are going, they don't want to go through it. Plus, the medical profession takes all your resources and you have nothing left either. I don't want them to get it. That's why I'll call Kevorkian. Hell with them. Better yet, I like to do things so my brain just explodes and it's all over. See, I'm 66, I kind of think about those things. You get older and you start reading obituary praises, pages and all that kind of stuff. Say, how am I going to go out? <laughs> Boy, I want to go out. I'm one of the nutty ones. When I was a fighter pilot many years ago, we were a wild bunch. I mean, they didn't have any rules when I went into it. It was fantastic. Of course, we killed a lot of guys, our own. We killed more guys in training than we did in Korea. We were wiping them out every day. And now it's out there one year, we killed 21 guys in one year. Of course, they would never permit that today. You know what the word was then when I went through there? If you make it through here, Korea's easy. We had a guy out there called Clay Tice. He said, this is a tiger program. Man, these guys got fangs. Headquarters sort of didn't like it. They didn't know what to do about it. Jets were new and, you know, they didn't know how to handle it. Eventually they did learn how to. But that was fun but painful. And I never thought I'd live beyond 40, actually, but I said, boy, am I going to have fun. So I surprised myself. I'm still here. So the problem's been delayed a little bit. In any case, let's go to the next chart. Go ahead. Yeah, you're, that's right. It's, it's, well, some people could say it's an unnatural part, too, but I understand what you're getting at. Uh, there's a nice book out that, that addresses that, and I told uh, Dick and some other people, and it's a softcover book. I think you can get it. Of course, now, nowadays, softcover books cost almost as much as hardcover a few years back. It's called Theories of Everything, Theories of Everything by John Barrow. And the key idea that he brings up there is, you know, you've got a very world out there, and what you have to do is you have to be able, in some sense, be able to compress that world into certain ideas in that so you can deal with the whole world. So they talk about the idea of compression. In other words, and also, Chaitin, remember I mentioned Chaitin on the algorithmic information theory, that he talks about that too. You've got to be able to have what they call compressibility. And what you want to do to your adversary, make his world incompressible. If he can't compress all that stuff, so all he's dealing with pandemonium and chaos, confusion, disorder, and you sweep out the debris. In other words, you want to fold him back inside himself. We talked about that earlier. <clears throat> and so you make his world incompressible, he naturally gets folded back inside himself. So he can't cope with the world, so he's out of date with the world. So in effect, then he comes up with all those dysfunctional characteristics that you like to have in your adversary, not in yourself. Or some people do it naturally to other people when they don't mean to. That's not too good. OK. Does that help answer your question? Compress, you gotta learn how to do it. There's a nice book out on it called Theories of Everything. Incidentally, somebody asked about that earlier, about theories of everything. The reason why he puts theories of everything in there, we got a lot of theories of everything, but there's no theory of everything. My question to that, if you have a theory of everything, and included within the theory, and you've heard about these new super string theories and all that crap, you know, and uh, that these physicists are talking about that are non-testable and that, and, 
And if it's, if it's such a great theory, and it includes everything, then within the theory should be how they came up with a theory, but they don't ever have that in there. It's a theory of everything. They should be able to describe how they came up with it. It can't be everything. Something, I don't know what, but it's not everything. Okay. Okay, now we talked about the previous chart. I said, maybe so relative to that last statement, that previous chart. Yet upon reflection, we solve a puzzle. Why does our world continue to unfold in an irregular, disorderly, unpredictable manner, even though some of our best minds try to represent it as being more regular, orderly, and predictable? We've got a problem there. Why is that the case? Next chart. Or what I say more pointedly. With so much effort over such a long period, we've had people centuries looking at this stuff now. By so many people to comprehend, shape, and adapt to a world that we depend upon for vitality and growth, why does such a world, although richer, more robust, continue to remain uncertain, ever-changing, and unpredictable? Ah, uh, we're going to get down to the nitty-gritty here. Next chart. And I'm not putting you off. The next chart I'll give the feature. But I say very simply, review of destruction creation, which you've got a copy there. This presentation, conceptual spiral, and your own experiences in the world, and they're very valuable. Reveal that the various theories, systems, processes, etc., that we employ to make sense of that world contain features that generate mismatches that in turn keep such a world uncertain, ever changing, and unpredictable. That, re that raises the question what the hell are these features? Next chart. And these features include the thing we've been talking about uncertainty associated with the unconfinement, undecided, but incomplete theorems of math and logic. They're there. We don't know how to get rid of them. Period. Numerical imprecision associated with the rational and irrational numbers in the calculation and measurement process. I want to talk to that. You have a rational number. Some people might not even know what a rational number is. And then you don't have to. I'm not trying to be insulting. You know, some things we study, some things we don't. But what is Take one over three, a whole number over a whole number. That's a rational number. And so what do you have? One over three, if you try to put it out decimal form, 0.3333 forever. An infinite expansion. At some point, you've got to truncate that thing. And any place you cut it off, you got an error. It's approximate. You don't have the right answer. Further out, there might not be as big an error, but you still got it. Now, in terms of rational numbers, there's a lot of those kinds of numbers, one over three. In terms of irrational numbers, all of them are that way. They're all non-ending. And once again, guess what? Irrationals dominate the rational. Another favorite statement. The rationals swim in a sea of irrational. That's the world out there. Now, how many of you people studied chaos theory or nonlinear dynamics? Anybody here? And know what they say. They're always talking about the problem is the initial conditions. They always say initial conditions. Why do they have the problem in initial conditions? Because we have rational and irrational numbers. They never can pin it down. And also, we got uh, Planck's uh, constant Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Because as they keep reaching back, they're eventually back in that domain. He can't pin it down. So the initial conditions come about because of that kind of phenomena. If they never explain that, that's what they should say. Say, why initial condition? Because of that phenomena. Then you got the entropy increase we talked about, the second law of thermodynamics. And we got the irregular, erratic, we're talking about nonlinear process. Ir irregular, or erratic behavior shows that far from equilibrium, open, nonlinear systems are processes with feedback. And that's most of the world. If you're in an equilibrium condition, you're dead. And you got incomprehensibility associated with inability to completely screen, filter, or otherwise consider spaghetti. I call them spaghetti like influence. I couldn't figure out another word. From a plethora of ever changing, erratic, or unknown outside events. And you got mutation, environmental pressure, replication errors, or unknown influence. They still haven't figured that out. Ideas are mutation. You get a new idea, that's a mutation, it's a mental mutation. New idea, too, spins off out of the hmm. Ambiguity associated with language. Not only language is interacting with one another, you know how they say, well, the structure of this language really doesn't allow you to put it in the same context in a new language. Also, within a language, you've got ambiguity. Is that bad? No, it's good. Because you didn't have ambiguity, it means we have everything figured out. We couldn't learn anything new. The ambiguity then permits new ideas. The ambiguity helps to make adjustments, to adapt, to adjust to the world. Not necessarily bad. It can be. And then novelty, we talked about that. Those things are there. Those are inherent in our various way we do business world, our mental processes, etc. Therefore, next chart. 
What am I getting at? The underlying message is very simple then. There is no way out unless we can eliminate the features just cited. Well, problem though, we don't know how to do this. Since we don't know how to do this, the world. Reorientation, mismatch, analysis, senses over and over again added times based to comprehend, shape, and adapt. But unfolding, evolving reality that remains uncertain, ever changing, unpredictable. That's the way it is, guys. Sorry. And this stuff is very recent kind of stuff. This is stuff that's come out in the 20th century. This is not the stuff that Newton and those guys found out. Very recent stuff. That's why I asked you about it in the beginning. Mary said, who's Girdle? Hardly anybody knew. Heisenberg, if you knew about it. Chait, I didn't mention him. That's why. Next chart. So now we're getting down to it. Now, if we cannot connect this continuing world with all this stuff we talked about up there, we can see that we have, what, a conceptual spiral for exploration, discovery, innovation, thinking, doing, achieving, learning, unlearning, relearning. That third one's very important. You gotta learn how to unlearn, too. If you keep some ideas in there, that inhibits your ability to go and arise to a new state. In other words, it'll keep you from making snowmobiles or adapting to new conditions. And people that can't unlearn, we call them dinosaurs, because they can't relearn. Comprehending, shaping, and adapting. Hence a conceptual spark for what I call insight, imagination, initiative. Next chart. We're about done. Which raises the question, can we survive and grow without these abilities? Next chart. I think it's very clear. Next chart. One word. No. Period. Next chart. Which suggests then the conceptual spirals we presented it here is a paradigm for survival and growth. That's exactly right. right. What I'm really showing you is the answers aren't as neat as a lot of people like to make, make it out to be. Not that way. We tried it. We don't know how to do it. Period. Next chart. My last chart, too. So that's my point. Final point the presentation. I'm sorry. See, if you lose, you're losing the game of survival and growth. The name of the game is to survive and grow. And it, it impacts us in many different dimensions. Well, this is not just military. We're talking about this is living or dying or advancing or decaying. That's what we're talking about. This is, this is the game, the real game. Any questions? Put the final point up again, please. Go ahead. I can construct different loops there, too, even though I do that. I've shown, I took that, if you want it, I can go that with you later on. There's different ways of looking at that, too. Well, in some sense, you know, I understand what you're saying. We can comprehend in some sense, but we can't do it in a perfect sense, even though I'm saying that. No, I, I'm, what you're saying, maybe I'm taking too many liberties here. You might be right. But when I'm saying comprehend, I'm talking about at least we can deal with the world out there. We might, mean the fact that we comprehend doesn't mean I have perfect knowledge. We, you know, we're getting, we're getting some, we're getting an idea of what's going on there, and hopefully it's better than what, we have to, better than what somebody else has if we have to deal with it. So I guess maybe I'm doing, I'm using a loose form if that's your, if that's your point. When I say comprehend, don't say that I've nailed it down. When I use the word comprehend, I'm not saying I've really nailed it down. It means I, I, I comprehend something. Else. But to say I've really nailed it down, I wouldn't say that. Of course, the further we go, that's... Well, we might know, learn other kinds of things. We might pin some things down, but then they and they in themselves may generate problems in other areas, which then become a larger context, so then we lose some of the comprehension in a larger sense. In fact, what 
what I've told people, I said, you know what progress is? You, you've led me into it. I've used this before, and I'm glad you raised that point. You know what I say progress is? Confusion at a higher level. That's what we're talking about here. You see what I'm saying? In a sense, that's what you're hinting at, is confusion at a higher level. Go ahead. Uh, there's one example. That you and of course, some people say maybe that's not progress either. I mean, they can chop me on that. That's a good chop too. Go ahead. You use an example done at a previous session we had uh, that talked about progress and uh, yeah. that the inquisitive, the people who are doing projects such as this, have to be constantly doing it. That is asking the question, why do those who think they already know? Progress the example you used was uh, looking at the F-111 and the offshoot of the F-111 being the new air superiority fighter, which eventually evolved into the F-15. Relate that uh, situation you went to hard stuff or you went to nice well, you know, the presentation well, just, uh, just well there's some there's let me, let me tell you what i had to go through this is a true story and there's going to be some little rough stuff i'll bring out here but it should be brought out because you're going to face it since you raised the point remember nice. let the record show he raised the point i didn't what happened was i was down at eglin air force and I was known as a maverick, still am. I mean, people have heard about that. But it turned out they were having trouble with an airplane they called the FX. That and they were trying to get a new airplane beyond the 111, the one you're talking about there. Is that what you're getting at? Am I get on the right track? Yeah, OK. I just want to be sure I'm on the right track. OK. And so my initial was on orders to go to Vietnam. My orders were canceled by the chief, and I was brought to the Pentagon by General McConnell. And so they gave me two weeks to uh, look at this FX proposal and, uh, and asked, me my, asked me for my evaluation. And the reason why they called me up there is because some work I'd done on energy maneuver building, other previous work, and they liked it. And for some reason, I was also a maverick. So if I goofed up, they had it both ways. If, if I did it right, they'd have a good airplane. If I didn't do it, they could throw me out of the Air Force. And I don't think some of them cared which way it went. So. In any case, I got to work on it. I looked at it. Of course, I really had the answer after a week. And really grim. I'm going to tell you how you get involved in this stuff. You're on some very important question. So how was I going to present my evaluation? And of course, they said, and also associated with recommendations. Easy to make evaluations. It's always the easy part. So my problem was not so much with evaluation and recommendation, but how I was going to present it to get their attention. And. Uh, so what happened was, I've got to use some rough words here, ladies, because I had to get their attention. Sometimes you've got to be mean. Because I knew they'd try to be, do it cosmetically. The, the whole up, idea up there is to do it cosmetically and pretend they do something new, and I had to get around that, and I knew that. So what happened was that uh, I'm thinking about this, see. I just arrived in the Pentagon, so I thought, oh, I said, wait a minute. If I get rough, they'll throw me out, and I don't want to be here anyway, so I got a good deal. So what happened was is I, I went in. And two things happened. First of all, to show you how the system works on you, was I was told I was going to have to render a report. I said, Great. Of course, I knew what they were thinking, but I know what I'm thinking. And uh, so the day before, I'm going to make my presentation to a higher level. I was a major, I was going to a senior colonel. Why, this junior colonel comes in, he says, well, you haven't submitted your report, your written report. I said, I'm not going to submit a written report. You, you said submit a report. I'm submitting a report. It's an oral report. You didn't say written. I'm giving an oral report, and it's on this yellow pad here. I didn't have a chart. And my writing is terrible. I have a hard time reading it. And I deliberately wanted it that way, because this guy was in a previous project that screwed up the airplane. And so if I submit it through him, he's going to pull out all the stuff that I want there, and we're going to get a cosmetic thing. So I had a decision to make. So he got mad. He said, well, you're not going to get away with this. I said, well, fine. I don't want to be here anyway. So I had nothing to lose. So then he goes up and sees a senior colonel, and he calls me. He says, I understand you don't have a report. I said, that's incorrect. It's not a written report. It's a well-thought-out report. In any case, you can make your evaluation while I've thought it out, and we'll proceed from there. He's fair enough. So I went in. I was afraid of this guy. I'm not afraid of him uh, uh, mentally, but afraid that he might draw the wrong conclusion. I want to be sure he drew the right conclusion. These are the, in fact, this is going to come out in a book. It's coming out, so I might as well bring it out now. It's going to be in a book coming out here in the next couple of weeks. I'd heard it was in there. I'm not sure. You might as well hear it from the horse's mouth. I don't know how correct they have it. In any case, 
I went in there, closed the door. I didn't want to have the secretary listen to my nasty words. And I said, look, I'm going through this very carefully. I said, you know what? I've never designed an airplane before, but I could fuck up and do better than this. He went straight up. That's exactly the impact I wanted to get. Get him mad. Because now he's going to have to listen carefully if he wants to take me out. On the other hand, if I got it right, I'm going to force him my way. Let the record show you raise it. In any case, what happened was I went through it. And the key thing that I did in evaluation, I said, OK, let me lay out the 111, because that's the airplane we're going to replace. So I laid out the fundamental care. I said, go to the blackboard. I had them, my chart and had them all laid out. I said, have I said anything incorrect? Is it enough there we can make sense of it? He said, yeah, OK. Now, let me lay out the so-called FX you're going to use to replace it, which is now we're down to the hard note. I laid out those characteristics. He said, OK. I said, is this the airplane you want? I said, now, if this is the airplane you want, I said, this is easy. I said, we don't even have to make this airplane. I can go back. I can show you what I can do on the 111. I can show you how to do the wing. I can make some changes on that. It'd be very cheap. And we can get this 10% increase just by changing the 111. Well, then he got even madder. Of course, I wanted him mad. I said, in other words, you don't like this 111. He says, absolutely not. I said, then how can you like this FX? How can you defend this piece of trash? That's what I called it. Now I had his attention. See, I got him locked in. See? He said, well, I can't. He said, what are you trying to tell me? I said, white piece of paper, start over. Oh, my God, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. Said, We're talking about a white piece of paper. This is garbage. So he looked at me. I remember that. Boy, he just looked at me. I said, if you don't like it, I said, I'm not your guy. I said, get some jerk in here. He'll make it 10% better than you think he got something new. He's OK. I want you to brief it exactly the way you briefed to me. Take it down to General Dempster. You start. He said, oh, incidentally, don't leave out about the part in the beginning about fucking up. That I want in there definitely, because I want to see his reaction like you looked at mine. He said, I'm ordering you to do that. OK. Vice Dempster went through the rope. You can't talk that way up here. I mean, what you got, man? And Richie, to his credit, says, I ordered him to do that. And the reason why, because I want you to listen carefully for the rest of it. And he bought it all. So we changed and the history of that is, and we wiped out, started all over, did some real trade-offs. That was all phony baloney. And we initially had a 60,000-pound airplane. That was, the, that was only on paper, too, with variable sweep wings, 110-pound wing loading, uh, 0.75 thrust-to-weight ratio. I forget, a lot of other goddamn junk in it. And a oh, whole engine, 2.2 bypass ratio, et cetera. And so then we ended up, after we went through the trade-offs, because he said, well, how are you going to do it? I said, well, I don't know what the answer is. I said, but here's the way I approach these kind of problems. And I said, I expect we'll do a lot better. So we came up with a 40,000-pound airplane with a 1.1 thrust to weight ratio instead of 0.75. Wing loading is 65. And uh, I forget, and I a number of but a lot cheaper. And they had one with a really, you know, a real Hummer. And that became the F-15. We forced them through the trade. I remember we went to engine meeting. I'll give you an example of engine meeting. See, all these engine guys, all they're worried about is turbo machinery and all this crap going on. And so I said, we got to start something fundamental on engine. We all got to start the same departing point, start, starting point. And I'm going to tell you, we're all going to start the same starting point. I'm going to see if you like mine. I said, here's what I know about the engine. Cold air goes in the front door. Hot air goes out the back door. It goes faster, and we call that thrust. Is that a good starting point? Of course, what it is, it's just a clever way of uh, describing Newton's second law, F equals MA, you know, in, in, a, uh, in a fluid sense. And they said, OK. I said, OK, so we're not going to hold it. Other than that, we're not going to hold anything else as an assumption. That's the only one we're going to start with. And we're going to work on that. We're going to look at the turbo machinery and all that stuff and see what holds together. What that doesn't hold together, run the trades of the engine. And out of those engine trades, we actually boil the engine down to a 0.6 bypass ratio. I it was and they never thought that would happen. They weren't looking at it correctly. As a matter of fact, we weren't sure to go 0.6 or turbojet. At that time, they didn't want to go any lower bypass. They said, well, it's fabrication problems and that. I said, OK. So then eventually, we decided on 0.6. But since then, we found out we can make 0.3 and 0.4 lower bypass ratio engines. But at the time we did it, we couldn't do it. It was fabrication. It was a much better engine. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff you got to do. You don't start. you got to challenge all assumptions. 
It's like, you know, we have doctrine. Air Force has got a doctrine. The Army's got a doctrine. Navy's got a doctrine. Everybody's got a doctrine. You read my work, doctrine doesn't appear in there even once. You can't find it. You know why I don't have it in there? Because it's doctrine on day one, every day after it becomes dogma. That's why. And so what I tell people, they say, well, I, say, I understand you're going to have to write doctrine. You have to do it. And I say, that's all right. But what you, even after you write it, assume that it's not right. And then not only that, look at a whole bunch of other doctrines, German doctrine, other kind of doctrines, and learn those too. And then you've got a bunch of doctrines in there. And the reason why you want to learn them all, then you're not captured by any one. Not only that, you can lift stuff out of here, stuff out of there, stuff out of there. You can play the snowmobile game, and you do better than anybody else. But if you've got one doctrine, you're a dinosaur. Period. Go ahead. Uh-oh. The engineering chart? The Go ahead. Well, he asked me about my... Remember, let the record show. Okay. Even though, in some sense, I was an individual, remember, I had to depend upon other people. I mean, I was doing some... I'm learning from a lot of these people at the same time in terms of some of these characteristics, even though I set up some of the plans and that. And one of the things I learned a long time ago, all the way out to Nellis and that, is any time that I got a team, I would get a very diverse kind of people on that team with very different skills, different orientation. And it was sort of instinctive. I understand better now why I do that. At that time, you know, it was sort of an instinctive kind of thing. It seemed like the right thing to do. Now I understand better because of some of the things I've been involved in. Because I found out by doing that, I would learn a lot more. In other words, I'm drawn from many, many different ideas. But then, after you think about that, you can do it not just with working with people, but many other things like doctrine and all the other kind of things I'm talking about. And in large companies, you have to do that. And that's why nowadays they're talking about these multifunctional teams. You heard about that in terms of new designs and all that stuff. And that's the key idea that Taichi Ono and Shigeo Shingo brought across. Where General Motors wasn't doing that. They had all these separate little compartments. And they'd get theirs done and pass the next department, get theirs done, pat, and all these guys in this department had like ideas. The guys in this department had like ideas. The guys in this department had like ideas. Rather than having, having a, a variety of ideas within each department and very rich interconnecting links. And that's what Ono, and that's what Shingo brought to the table. I mean, they were sort of the... Uh, you know, sort of the orchestra leader, but, you know, without the orchestra, they can't play. They've got to have these different things. They're sort of keeping track of things and that. And so that's where the Toyota production system came out of. You know what Taichi Ono did, since I didn't bring it up, since you brought it up, one of the things that he saw through it, he didn't see it. They even, in the States here, we still don't understand what Taichi Ono did. For most, many people are writing about it. And I get mad when I said, this is baloney. I have read his book, and I know what he's saying. And one of the things he found out which is hard to believe, I'll tell you how he made his snowmobile, using my term, was he was looking at automobile production. He learned a lot from Henry Ford and from other Americans. A lot of these ideas he got from Henry And one of the key ideas he got was from supermarket and automobile production. Let me explain how he did it. It's beautiful. It's brilliant. Brilliant. What happened was he had some Japanese after World War II, I don't know the exact period after, they were going to the United States and they were trying to set up Toyota production. So he was a vice president of Toyota at the time. I think maybe general manager, but he eventually went to vice president. And they went back to the States and they were very fascinated by American supermarkets. This is in the 50s. Because they didn't have those in Japan. And so they were very fascinated about that. So he's asking all these guys to come back, what, what do you do in a supermarket? And they're explaining it to him. He wasn't even in one, but he had the right idea. How you took the cart and went around, grabbed all the stuff and check out counter and all that sort of thing. And then he started thinking about that. He started thinking about automobile production and that. He says, well, we can fold that idea into automobile production. Supermarkets? Nobody ever thought about that before. Let me tell you what he does. He's we're thinking about it the wrong way. He's what we really want to do is when you're, when you're getting supplies coming to assembly line and all that, the various parts, and until you finally go to the assembly line and walks out the back door, he's we're doing it the wrong way. Instead of top down, we've got to go bottom up. What we want to do is just like the customer goes in the store and picks stuff off the shelf, 
the later provider, I mean, the, the, you know, in other words, you have the earlier provider, the later provider, the later provider. So he says, treat each later incident as the customer and the earlier incident as the provider. So you have a chain of providers and customers, provider, and ultimately goes out the door. And he said, well, we want to do, instead of the provider given to the customer, the customer tells the provider exactly what he wants and when he wants it, called the just-in-time system. He got out of the supermarket. So he sets a reverse information flow from the bottom up to the top, in which they only get what they want at the time they want it at, using that supermarket idea. Instead of just pushing stuff down, the guy's got to put it together and goes out the door. And by doing it that way, by upsetting, inverting the whole process, able to get a whole bunch of inventory out when they didn't have to have expensive inventory. Plus the fact, since they only wanted the amount, therefore, and since they're looking at it more carefully, they're not making as many goofs in terms of the automobiles. And there's some other things he folded in there in terms of what you call ex uh, single minute exchange of die and a whole bunch of other stuff by which they're able to actually run, but when they set that process in motion, they, instead of having a production line for this car, a production line for this car, and a production line for this car, they have one production line run a whole mixed flow going down a production line, all different kinds of cars, and keep track and actually have higher quality with less labor. Beautiful synthesis. And the book's called The Toyota Production System by Taichi Ono. And you want to read it? And there's another guy by the name of Shigeo Shingo. Let me tell you what he did. In fact, he worked with Ono. And they work together. Very complementary skills. Very different guys, but very complementary, very strong-willed people. And what Ono did is one of the key things that, I mean, excuse me, Shingo, one of the key things that Ono did, or saw, he saw it actually before Shingo did, but Shingo's figured out how to do it. He said, you know, the problem we have is that if you want to run more than one, they, want, they recognize you want to run more, more than one model down the line, then they have a thing called industrial engineering, some of you people might have heard of course, economic lot quality, or quantity, excuse me, optimal lots and that. And so if you make too small a lot, why then, you know, economies go out the window. So in any case, Ono figured what we really have to learn how to do is you have these die. And what happens if you go to another market to change the die? Well, it usually took a whole afternoon, four or five hours to change the die, and that was fast at that time. Well, then he gave an order to Shingo to see if he could fulfill it. He said, I want you to give me where we can have what he called be able to change our dyes in 10 minutes. Four hours. And Shingo thought Ono was crazy. But Shingo's the guy that knew how to do it. In the meantime, he'd actually been collecting information from working on all these different jobs over a number of years. He describes it beautifully in his book. He's got all this different information. And all of a sudden, after Ono told me, he said, no, maybe we can do it. He's putting it all together. Ono didn't know whether it could be done. He said he just gave it to Shingo. He didn't know what else to say. Gave him an impossible task. Guess what? Ono did it. Nobody had ever done that before. Then after he thought it over again, he fed it. He started about thinking other stuff. He was able to do it down to three minutes and eventually got it down to one minute exchange of die. Well, then you have no longer an economic life. Want it. Well, you can just change this stuff back and forth. And you have one production line, you just run different kinds of models. And he's drawn from all these different kinds of things. He's, he's explaining all he's drawn from. He's, boy, is that guy ever building snowmobiles? And so is Ono. And they're drawn from other guys. And one thing that's interesting about Shingo all the time, when he hears somebody say something, he listens very carefully. He always talks about, I gotta listen. He's saying something different. I haven't heard this before. He says, this one can actually think it's wrong, but it might not be wrong. It's only wrong because I haven't thought about it before. But he always has to be prepared. You notice how some people say, ah, that's wrong. He didn't say that. Okay, I'm listening in receive mode. In fact, we had a guy when he was up in the Pentagon, we called him Dr. No. Boy, great logic. Fantastic logic. When we had the initial meeting, said a lot of this stuff, he'd come in here and destroy the whole thing. He always said, this can't be. I finally said, no way, you're out. Never come in here again until we're ready for it. So remember what I said? Observations, analysis, synthesis, hypothesis, and test. The test was to test it against him. After we had it all figured out, he said, boy, this guy really knows how to chop stuff. We're gonna let him look at it but at the end, not in the beginning. Never get him in there in the beginning. Very sharp, very qualified. So I brought him in the beginning. He had a skill. I said, Howard, you're not coming in here until we're ready for you. I said, because if we bring you in here, we got a disaster. So I bring him in, and now let's chop it. He'd come in, so fine, out, up the door, wouldn't let him in again, rework the thing, ready, back in, out, back in until we got it right. So he had a role of film, he did it very well, but not in the beginning. Go ahead.
Well, one of the things is that, uh, as I told you before, if I can go through my development loop faster in my head, in fact, I got some articles here I'm going to leave here, which is this, well, no, they're not this, not discussed. Yeah, it is discussed in there. No, not the one I got. Damn, it's not in there. I thought it was. Not in that one. But in any case, if you can go through and set up a faster tempo rhythm than your adversary, you're in effect doing that to them. And that's what Ono and Shingo did, what they were able to do. See, in, in the United States, we're better now. So when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about prior to 1988 or 89. Now we're getting better at General Motors. General Motors still got some problems, but for it, they're, they're, turn, they're turning things over from, in order to make a design, it used to take us about at least five years. In other words, we had an idea to finally get the design, try to shove it out the door. You understand what I'm saying? Automobiles I'm talking about. What Ono and Shingo figured out how to do, I mean, as a result of their activities, it sort of fell out. I mean, they didn't start this way. It's sort of a fallout. They were able to start with a new idea when a design came up with a new car and do it in about three years or two and a half years, about half the time. Well, think about that. If you're only doing half the time, instead of having those people working all a long period of time, it costs a lot less, too. Plus, you get ahead of the marketplace. So in other words, you capture the market before the other guy does. Plus, then you've got it only going down to very few production lines instead of a lot, so you have less, you have less expense there. You see how you get, see what happened? We're shipping materials to Japan, raw material. They make automobiles and ship the car back and they can still do it cheaper than we can. Well, not so much now because they got, we got a currency problem, but before that. Well, that means, you know, you got a very inefficient process if somebody can get away with that. Let me give you an example. Did you raise that point? A good example. It's in a book uh, called Machine That Changed the World. Anybody read the book? It's called The Machine That Was Written by MIT a team up there at MIT that looks into automobile production, those kind of things. And there's one interesting, well, there's more than one interesting, this particular chart drew, drew my attention. In which, what they, what they tried to do, they want to compare two models, Japanese model versus General Motors model, and particularly Toyota they were comparing. Now, they couldn't get it exactly, cars aren't exactly, but try to get them as exactly as they could. And over a month's production, or a couple months' production, number of cars put out, and then figure out the number of man hours that went into that car the labor that went into it. And at the end of it then, figure out how many man hours per automobile on the average over a certain period. And try to do it legitimate so you don't fix it where Japanese are high one month, the other one's low. In other words, on a uh, apples versus apples basis. Well, having done that, what they found out, the average man hours for the Japanese per automobile, pump out a car, the model they were talking about, roughly a little over 17 hours, man hours, pump out a car. For General Motors at that time, it's a plant they looked at, typical plant. Over 30 hours, things that recall is 32 hours. And not only that, the Japanese quality was better. You know, you can't win when you're, you can't beat somebody if that's the way the game's being played. You can't compete. And so what you have to learn how to do is, in the end, an organization by itself doesn't come up with the idea per se. There's people working together and then in the end, you know, you sometimes you have to get off in isolation and draw from somebody else, figure it out, then go back in. You just can't be there in, in the hubbub all the time because otherwise you'd be like this. But in the end, you're still drawing from it. See, I learned from a lot of people. Remember what Newton said before he died? Anybody remember what he said before he died? Very famous statement. I'm, I'm, I don't know that I quoted it exactly, but I can at least paraphrase it. He said, if I was able to see farther than anyone else, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. Before he died. In other words, he drew from Kepler, he drew from Galileo, he drew from Descartes, he drew from, in other words, he's taking those bits and pieces and did it. I understand that. Because, like, taking toilet paper preparation is a way of stabilizing the wing. Mm -hmm. Or a bottle. It takes plant behavior and figures out it's another line. In trying to look at new ideas, It's an excellent question, and I'm not sure I got a good answer, but I'll try to answer it. It's, it's, it's sort of an intuitive process. I, what I learned a long time ago is I like to learn, look at different things. I found out somehow, I don't know when it's going to be valuable to be valuable later on, is what, I really, is what I've learned over a long period of time. And for some reason, I was able to see into that analytical synthetic process. So you just sort of have to look at different things, not knowing whether you're going to use it. Like when I first read that, uh, uh, when I read some of this stuff on, um, when I took Heisenberg, for example, when I took physics at, uh, at Georgia Tech there, 
I instinctively knew that that Heisenberg principle had more bearing than what they said it had. And I read every kid, I said, okay, I understand what they're saying. I understand how they even derive the goddamn thing. But you know, this just isn't atomic physics or subatomic physics. It must have bearing elsewhere. I mean, I didn't know, but it always in my mind. In fact, I, I just a few weeks ago at my physics book, I had stars all over that page, in VIP, which means very important. This is, and I didn't have it in other page. I, this is very important. And, it, and the reason why I remember when I went back is because this was back in 1960. The reason why I remember that, because, uh, because when I took that, I was very struck by that. You have to be sort of struck by certain things because of your experience and be open. Sure. Yeah. Obviously. But don't, the key, I think the key thing to do that is don't try to assume that something is wrong because it doesn't fit into your orientation and say, well, that's wrong. I don't do that. Initially, I look at it and say, I wonder what he's saying here. Am I thinking about that? I always deliberately try to caution myself. Am I, am I, I want to see, what I always try to do, and here's a key point that I try to do. This is a key point. When I'm reading something new and different, I try as, insofar as possible as I can, is to try, and you can't do it exactly. Can I see it through his eye, not mine? In other words, I want to adopt his point of view, suck up his point of view, so I don't let my own orientation drown out what he's trying to tell me. See? And you, ha you, you have to do that in the beginning. Now, and you have to, and I, it took me, you know, when I was younger, I didn't do that. It was, it was, it was, when I, became, well, I think when I became a fighter pilot, that's when I learned how to do it. My experiences at Nellis had a very deep impact upon me. I know that. Other people know that. For some reason, they just, because it was 19th century, you know, I call it, see, I had a degree in economics. I, God, this is great. This is like 19th century capitalism in the sky. You know, everybody's a free booter, a buccaneer. Says, this is fantastic. We can do whatever the hell we goddamn please. Those generals don't know what the hell we're doing. And we did it. Of course, we lost a lot of guys. Well, it, you can look at, no, I would say you can look at, at what I, that's a good question, yeah. I would say don't be too narrow each one. Each guy will have his own skills. But then the thing I'm going to say, because you're going to have certain, you're going to bring onto the table certain skills. What's your background? What's your background? Okay. Okay, but other people might have biology background or psychology or, you know, different kind of background. So don't worry about it. Don't feel like, you know, geez, I'm intimidated to the guy. Bullshit. you got a background to bring to the table. you got a goddamn good background. And so what you want to do, though, is don't allow yourself to go into the trap because you have a certain kind of a background to check out these other ways. Well, that's theirs and that's mine. What you want to, insofar as possible, if you don't understand, make them explain it again. I used to make people, I said, I don't understand you. Tell me one more time. I'm a dumb shit. Till I get it right. In fact, Here's a good, here's a good thing. You, you raised me to another point that I used to help people. Let's say I ask a question to you. I say, okay, here's my question, whatever it is. Now you're gonna say, okay, you're gonna, in your own mind, try to respond to that question, right? I might look at it and I say, geez, I don't like that response. So now I reform the question, maybe to you or to somebody else. They pump a response to that then. I'm not sure I like that response. In other words, I don't seem like I have a good matchup between a question and response. Then I ask somebody else a question. And I keep going through this till finally I say, boy, now I got a matchup. Now let's examine that process. When I ask the first question to you, I get a response. So probably what's going to happen, I may moder I may treat that question a little bit differently. Say, well, maybe I didn't say it right. You might want to say it a different way. I might pump it back to you or maybe to somebody else. So as you go through, and you go all the way through that thing, so then the question you have to ask yourself. What's the purpose of the question in the first place? Now, having gone through this in my mind, I'm asking a rhetorical question. It's unfair for me to ask you and ask you to draw it out right away if, if you haven't thought about it. Of course, you may hit it. You may have gone down a similar line of thought. So I'm asking not to embarrass anybody, but as a rhetorical question, because I've gone through these kind of processes. And the whole reason why I say that, what's the purpose of the question, is to find the right question. Because my initial question might have been a dumb goddamn question in terms of a context. So in that context, there are no dumb questions if they lead to the right question. Don't be afraid to ask a dumb question. Those guys that ask the right question right off the bat means they've already gone through this process and they're trying to impress people. Because a lot of these goddamn meetings, everybody's trying to see who's going to be top dog rather than trying to figure out what we're going to do. So don't be afraid to ask that dumb question because then you can adjust it until finally you get to the right question. You're going to stay around. No, I'm done.
I'm sorry I took all your time. You can turn it off. <laughs>